So as Liz says, what I want to talk about today is starting out in open source where you're, you're at, that, you're at the, the bottom, so to speak, where you're trying to make that first contribution and then you want to build up along and eventually you know, your goal might be to get to the top and become a maintainer. And I know from my own experience of starting out, you know, you look at a maintainer and you think that's somebody, you know, I can never be that person, you know. And hopefully when I walk through this today, you know, it's just a series of steps over a period of time and it's just building up your confidence. And as Liz uh, mentioned, Tom Meadows had a really nice talk uh, earlier today, if you can catch it, uh, it should be recorded. And, and that's just his experiences as he went along and he touches on a lot of that about, you know, being unsure, not, where, not knowing where to start and all that. And that's, that's really, really important. So I put this talk together because of my own experiences starting an open source about eight or nine years ago in a community which is the OpenStack community. Um, so it's, it's more based around the infrastructure layer. And then over the years then I've worked in other communities like Elastic, uh, Kubernetes, Helm and, and OpenTelemetry. So, just kind of to, to help you get through, the, uh, to give you, I suppose, an insight into the things that I saw that helped me as I went along. So, who am I? Uh, as I said, my name is Martin Hickey, and I'm working in the, in the industry for about over 26 years. Uh, I spent a good period of that working in enterprise products, and then, as I say, for the last nine or ten years, I started working in uh, open source. Um, and my journey into it was, you know, um, as I say, it was in OpenStack, but first of all, I was working what you call downstream. So I was working on a product that was built on top of OpenStack. And then what I saw uh, when I went to a conference, my first conference, I was just blown away by the collaboration of people from all different companies working together to try and get stuff done. So that was kind of my taster and put me on, on the road to it. Uh, I'm a core maintainer for Helm and on the TOC committee for uh, the Helm community and um, I'm a contributor to Kubernetes and OpenTelemetry and I work over in uh, IBM. Just to give you an idea of what, I, what I'm going to be covering today. So let's get going on starting out. Um, so I chose this for two reasons. Uh, both Ireland and the UK, we like our teas. Okay? And, you know, there's not just one tea, do you know? And for the coffee lovers out there or the coffee connoisseurs, you know, you think you have all these different, well, I like coffee as well, but you think you have all these different types? Oh, and tea, it just goes on and on and on. And the serious side of this is, like, when people start out first, they want to do open source and we're mad to get in, I want to do open source. But I think one of the first things to say is, what do you want to work on? And I think that's key. Finding that project you want to work on because if you choose the project that probably you've the most interest in, then when things get challenging, as they do always, you have a better chance of staying in with it and keeping going. And the example of that is there was a person I was mentoring a number of years ago and they wanted to get started in a certain community. And uh, before they started getting, he was actually in Helm at the time, and I said, okay, all right. I said, first of all, before I start bringing you out into the community, write down the, the top five communities you want to get involved in, in order, in order priority, and tell me the reasons then. So he went away anyway, and he was probably a bit miffed, you know, his first mentoring session, and I sent him away after 10 minutes to go away and uh, find out, you know, something that he knew himself in his own head. And he came back with the list then, and suddenly Helm, Helm was number five. Not because Helm is, is, is a poor community or a bad community or anything else, it's because when he sat down to think about it, he realized he had an interest in another community or other communities. So he went away and worked in that community for a while, for about a year or so, and I was trying to get him to move on to the next stages of it. But he hadn't driven forward. He, he'd made some uh, contributions, but he hadn't really started doing lots of reviews and getting forward, which I'll touch in a while. And I found out afterwards then, he didn't want to say it to me, but he didn't like the community. And he wanted to try another community. And when he went to the next community, that's when he found his feet. He really then drove on from being just a contributor to moving on to be a committer. 
doing serial contributions and really adding to the community and driving the community. And it was all, all about finding that. Now, I put a little asterisk here because sometimes this is taken out of your hands. Sometimes your manager or your company will say, you need to go and work in this community. And you'll just have to improvise in that situation. But just to get an exposure to an open source community is amazing. And I hope you've seen that uh, over the last two days here at the conference. <clears throat> Read the docs. Hands up anyone that has ever heard this phrase. Hands up, keep the hands up if you've actually followed that rule and read the docs. Mm, it's in between. Most of us are out there, we buy the thing, we bring it home, we rip it out of the box and we want to get going. We, no one wants to read the docs. And hands up here, anyone here who writes a lot of documentation. Does that upset you? Yeah, I'm in both camps. I write, write quite a bit of documentation. I feel people should follow documentation, but you know, I'm talking about both sides of my mouth because <laughs> sometimes I don't follow the documentation. Now, why I bring this up is there is so much value in documentation that if a community uh, structures the documentation correctly and has it laid out properly, then all the information should be there for a person starting out new into a community. And I'll give you an example of this is, from my own personal experience in the Helm community is, I would say 50% of questions I come across, I can, I can answer them with a URL from documentation. Now I would put, I would put some text in and, and then I would say, for more details, refer to here. And that says to me that people don't read the documentation, which slightly upsets me because I put a bit of work into documentation, but that's just life. Um, but why I'm saying this to you is that if you are starting out in a community, rather than coming out asking questions in Slack and people might go, oh, you know, the answers are there, it's a nice way for you too to break yourself in. It's a nice way for you to find out, you know, about the product and so forth and how things work. And also, you know, what is the ladder up along, you know, starting out with, first of all, as a contributor, and is there different fields like becoming a reviewer, uh, becoming a member of the community, and so on and so on, up to a maintainer to find out what they are. So that if you have this goal of becoming a maintainer in that community, you can, you can, um, you'll know how to go there. And the final one then is around the communication channels, finding out when the meetings are on and what Slack channels and stuff are done, are out there. And like, maybe at the start, you're not going to be verbose. Maybe you, maybe you are a very outgoing person and you'll jump in there and get going. But maybe like a lot of us, you're a bit shy at the start and you would like to hold back a bit and just see what's going on. And that's a great place in the meetings and in the Slack channels to get information because you'll hear the conversations that are going on. So it's a nice way to get you, to get you started. Take it for a spin. Try it out, see how it works. Get going. Now this may seem obvious, you know, but you know sometimes when we're trying to get going in, 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 a, in a project we may jump into the code really early or something like that. Rather than say, all right, maybe bring down the binary first, start playing with that. Maybe then try and um, uh, build the dev environment. Now you might say, well I don't do dev, I don't, I don't write code, you know, I do documentation or I do tests or whatever else. That is still a contribution and to be able to write the docs and do the tests and stuff, you have to know how, how the product works. So knowing how to, make the, uh, to, to create the build environment, uh, to be able to set up your development environment and be able to deploy it and run it is very, very important. Now, one of the key things you'll get out of this is you will inevitably find bugs in the documentation and maybe in the environment you set up. Now, you're probably saying in your own mind, doesn't that say the community haven't properly done due diligence? They're not watching what they're at. This is just a part of life uh, because there's so much going on and documentations are, be, uh, are being written at different times, things change, etc. Also, sometimes when maintainers write documentation, they'll take things for granted. So they will, they will expect the dependency to be on their system because they've been using it for so long and they'll forget the little steps that are needed for somebody who starts out. Because when you start out, it's going to be very hard to know, to know everything. You do everything in a step-by-step -step manner. You don't know that, oh, 
I need that particular dependency. Oh, I need that tool installed on my system if it's not in the documentation or a script that you can run. So this is a great place for you to get started, find issues and push, push contributions out. Now, if you're someone who I only write code, well, here's a wake up call. You know, code is not the only contribution in the community. It's, 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 it's a facet of it, and it's key to, to building the tool or the product or whatever, but documentation and other contributions are really, really important as well. And also, it's a nice way to get your name out there, your GitHub handle, so people get to know you. Here's a one I always find difficult, and people that meet me, and oh yeah, you're able to go up and talk, but I find it hard always getting started and becoming visible. Now, why is it important to become visible? And what I mean by visible is getting known in the community. Uh, your, your GitHub handle out there. And the thing with that is, the importance of this is that if you want to build up your kudos or your respect in the community so that you can get things done, you need to start becoming visible and known. Because you have to remember in projects, people come in every day raising issues, pushing PRs. No, you're not known from Adam or from, or from Anne or for anyone else. So when you come in, you have to build, build that trust up with the other maintainers and the other community members to know that you're a genuine person that's here to help out the community. So the way to do this is, is getting involved in stuff. You know, joining the meetings and maybe seeing what's going on and then getting involved and maybe, you know, saying, you know, it's a good place to put your hand up if you want to volunteer. Um, another good thing is looking at issues that come in. Because there's so much to be learned from an issue that comes in. Maybe at the start you don't want to, to add a comment, but you'll see the interaction that's going on and you'll see the feedback that comes in and it might also point you to parts of the code and stuff where, where, thing, where things are, where issues are, and you'll have an idea and you'll be able to start looking. And what it does is, is it's a great learning part. The same as well with PRs. You know, when you see the reviews that are going on. And when you build up your confidence then, one of the nice things to do, and it really helps the community and maintainers workload is, that if an issue comes in, that you try that issue out. And you see, can, can I reproduce the issue? And if you can, you can put a comment into the issue and say, yeah, I was able to reproduce it uh, in such and such a way. Or I, I wasn't able to reproduce it and ask the OP, can you give me more information? Or maybe you might have some feedback that you've built up as you've gone along and you might be able to uh, help them. Because that's what issues are usually about. It's number one, it can be helping the person. If, if they've, uh, it's always helping the person. But number one, it could be that maybe it's not a bug, maybe it's just a misunderstanding and helping that person along. Or number two, it might be a key bug that you're trying to look at, or finally it might be a new piece of functionality. The same with the pull request. When you get your confidence then, you can start reviewing it. And don't worry if you're wrong or you, you make a comment that's wrong. Communities, 99.99% of the time, you know, aren't out there to shoot you down if you get something wrong. And the only way to learn is by taking that chance and putting it out there. Everybody gets something wrong in their time. I've even heard Liz Rice has got something wrong once or twice. You know? So, you know, people get stuff wrong. There's nothing wrong of it. You know, and if you get shot down for that, there's something wrong in that community or that person that has done that. It should not happen. <clears throat> as I said, the weekly calls are really good as well because they give you that ability to hear what's going on and your ability to volunteer. Okay. So we've gone through the first phase where you're trying to make that contributions. And I've suggested picking your project is key. Looking at the docs because of the value that's in there. Trying out the project and see, seeing if you can find any issues and also understanding how it works under the hood. And then starting to become visible. So what you're doing is you're building your way up nice like this. You know, you're, 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 you're feeling your way into the community, so to speak. Because generally people don't come in like a tornado right through the middle of a project. You say, hey, I've arrived, I'm such and such, look how great I am. Because people go, ah, sorry, I don't know who you are. You know, uh, that kind of way. So, you know, it's, it's, it's taking it easy as you go along and making your way in. <clears throat> so I suppose the middle part of it then is, now that you have started making contributions, 
How do you go to the next level? How do you become a committer, i.e. a serial contributor? How do you make more and more contributions? And how do you suddenly start earning the kudos where they go, I know such and such a person, you know, whatever handle, I don't know, M. Hickey or whatever, or Hickey M.A. or whatever, I know, I know that person, they've been making great contributions, we can see them growing along. So let's see how you build on that to get to that level. Hands up here who's heard the phrase, don't be a drive-by uh, contributor. So this is why I'm doing this, because we throw these phrases out in the community, and most people go, the hell is that? I've never heard of that in my life. Um, what we mean by that is, if you come in, do a few contributions, and start disappearing for months on end, you know, it's very, very hard to trust you if that's happening. Now, I know we've all stuff going on in our lives, with our jobs, with families, with, with whoever, um, and we have lives outside of, of, of work. So, that can be hard, but it, the key here is if you start in a community, try and contribute uh, something to that community every week as much as possible. Um, because that's how you get known and that's how you get trusted. And like the picture here, communities is all about people working together, doing bit by bits to help build that community up. <clears throat> Don't be that person. Uh, being authentic, sincere, and kind aren't just words we throw around the place. You know, and I think society as a large is getting better and better on, you know, sometimes we hear about, you know, soft skills. Soft skills are one of the key parts of life. You know, if you're, it, let's say you're doing horse trading or you're bartering for, some, for something. You know, if you want to get the price down or you want to get a, be, a better price for the thing you're selling or buying, you know, you need to trade. You need to, you know, you need to build that rapport with the person. It's the same in the community. It's kindness that keeps communities going and the sincerity of work. And it should be obvious, but every now and again, you get someone who just acts as a jerk. And it happens. Um, it's happened in one or two communities I've been in. And what has happened in those situations, just in case you think maybe I'll, I'll try it out and see how it goes, you will get a warning. And then if you don't stop, you probably get temporarily suspended. And then eventually you get removed from the community and blocked. Uh, because a person that's going to be unkind and rude and basically, you know, not be nice to people isn't going to help the community drive it forward. And really, it's not the way to go. So obviously, don't be that person. Now, I suppose don't confuse that either with sometimes when you push in your, your first contributions or whatever, you may get reviewed and there may be, you know, different comments may come back, etc. You know, just be aware that sometimes, you know, those comments are to help, help you and not to take it personally. I know it may feel personal, but to just take it on board and, and move with it. <clears throat> and one last thing is that, you know, be kind to everyone, especially the people that sometimes don't deserve it. So sometimes as maintainers, we get comments back, you know, that are a little bit unfair. You know, I know someone's trying to get something in or they feel something's a bug, but sometimes you know, we as maintainers have a, a more holistic or full approach of the project and we realise that thing can't be done or whatever. And we get comments back that sometimes you go as a bit unfair or we say, well, do you know, I explained that there and then someone might go, oh, all right, sorry, I didn't mean, you know. So we, we, are, we try and be kind as best as we can always, regardless of what the comments that come to us. The big one, the chop wood and carry water. Hands up, who's heard this phrase? Yeah, we, yeah, there we go again. To me, this is about volunteering, 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 helping. Do the jobs that other people don't want to do. Ha, does anyone know what it's like to clean the drains out in their house? Hands up. It's the most god-awful job ever. You know what I mean? I don't care what you think of it. I brought my son lately, 
And, and he was going, oh, clean the drains, that's all right. So I brought him in. I thought he was going to get sick, the poor guy. You know what I mean? He, he turned green. You know, these are the things in communities to do. Get out there and do the jobs that other people don't want to do. Because sometimes those jobs, you know, people have, can't get to them or, or whatever else. So one of the things that happened to me when I worked out on, I worked in the Neutron Project, which was a networking project in OpenStack. And there was this piece of work sitting there, uh, and it was a priority for all the projects in OpenStack, where they wanted the configuration files uh, for the project uh, generated, not static files. And I was working in some area, and, and someone mentioned to me, one of the maintainers mentioned, do you want to look at this because, you know, you were in this area today. And the minute, you know, they said it to me, and I looked at it, and I went, oh, no, this is going to be horrendous. It, it involved trawling through all the code, finding out where all the configurations were, and then putting in the annotations in there, and then removing the static files. I said, oh, no, this is going to go on for a long time. And I went, yes, I'll do that. Thanks very much. Little did I know the impact it would have. Yes, the first PR that went in was ages. It must have taken two months to get it in. It was a huge thing. And after that, there was a few other difficult ones to go in. But the feedback I got and how I got noticed by the maintainers was amazing. And we had a mid, they used to have mid-cycles then before, the, um, before every conference. And at the mid-cycles, a lot of maintainers came up to me and said, thank you so much for doing that work. They said, you know, they, they said, are you Hickey MA? I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks very much for that. Because in the community, you're probably known by your GitHub handles as opposed to your names. But it just shows you what, when you do stuff like that, what the, the feedback is for you afterwards or the, what the benefit for you is. And the last thing is, when you're trying to build yourself up along is, you know, be present. We have mindfulness. We talk about this a lot in the last number of years. But mindfulness means mind not full which means concentrate on the thing you're in. So whatever you can allocate every week to the project, put that effort in and don't be doing different things at once because we can't always juggle it. So be there and be present and, be, and make sure you're contributing. Right, so we're now gonna move on to the last part of becoming a maintainer. How am I on time? I'm a little bit tight. Okay, oh, I have 20 minutes. Oh, do I? I was beginning to rush it along. I thought it was, he says 35. Oh, God, yeah, this was on earlier, yeah. All right, okay, I know where I am now. Sorry, I got lost the sense of time there. Like, um, okay. Um, so we've just covered around the middle part of, uh, will we call it your journey? Yeah, it's more your journey. I, I don't like the word career for some reason. I don't know what it is. But anyway, it's your journey in, in, in the project you're in or your open source journey is. And we looked at, you know, building up your eminence, making those contributions, volunteering. I talked about the chop wood, carry water, and just getting more and more involved and making more and more difference in the community. And we use a word um, in Irish, it's called mehel. And it's a really old Irish word. I don't know what the, trans the direct translation is in community, but what it was was when loads and loads of little farms were in communities, they'd go from one farm to the next, uh, working together. So everything was done manual, it was before machinery and stuff. So they used to cut the grass with size and all that, and then they'd make the hay out of it, and they'd move then. Once they were finished there, they'd go to the next one, to the next one. And then it always ended with the Mia Sound, which is Halloween in Irish. And, you know, we've read great pagan cultures on it, around Halloween and all that, and it'd be the, the end of the harvest, and then people would all get together. But it was that whole sense of community, and that's what you're doing here. You're, you may think, I'm just this person doing some contributions here, but you're a major part of the community, helping to drive it forward in everything you do. So going on to the zenith at last, you now want to get up to that peak of where you're a maintainer. But little do you know, all the work that you did you know, in the middle part of your journey has prepared you for the final part. You've done all the hard, hard work volunteering. You've done all the hard work pushing contributions in, getting things ready. You might have helped at, had some of the conferences, etc. You might have even had done a, a talk at the conference. 
and you've, you've prepared yourself for the last part. And really then, it's just getting yourself nominated. And this depends on the community <coughs> you're in. So sometimes it's you send an email to the community, other times it's you create a PR. Um, also, maybe it's the project technical leader uh, nominates you and so forth. So there's different ways depending on the community. But the, the, the key point here is that you, you have the work done when you come to it. So I suppose it's the same as when you're getting promoted in your career. By the time you come to the promotion, you're at that level already. But here's the key then. Like in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So now you have keys of the kingdom. Now, now you have the responsibilities that come with it. Now, this is no big thing, but I suppose for you then, one of your key parts when you become a maintainer is, you know, facilitating and helping people and unblocking them, really, is one of the key parts. Yes, other parts around security and different things that go on behind the scene, but it's helping people go forward in reviews and looking at issues and stuff like that and helping other people become involved is the key. Because remember yourself, when you were coming into the community, someone always puts a hand out, metaphorically speaking, to help you up to pull you up along. And you, you have the same responsibility then as you, as you go along. And helping people is key in that. And, um, and that's how communities keep driving forward, um, by having, having the ability where, you know, new people come into the community, and then the people that are the maintainers in the community keeping it driving forward and going in the right direction. <clears throat> Okay, so sustainability is a slide I had to put in here because uh, it's part of a thread that's going through the, the conference. But I think it's a really nice thread going forward. I probably would have called it something different before. And when I talk about the slide, we'll have a look at it. Um, you probably have all seen that diagram as well on the internet. Um, to me, and this is, I suppose, my, my opinion of it, and other people have different ways of explaining it. But for me, I break it down into two categories. First of all, what open source provides, and then what open source requires. And looking at the first one, the provides is probably something you've probably thought about yourselves. And for me, one of the key things is the collaboration. And I said, when I went to my first conference, which was I think the OpenSAC conference in Atlanta in maybe 2013, I would say. Um, I was blown away by all these people, you know, working in all the different companies, you know, trashing stuff out. Doesn't mean there wasn't disagreements or, you know, or, or um, I wouldn't say arguments, discussions, but, you know, people were trying to look at the bigger picture, so to speak. And I think today this collaboration is very important because before, I suppose, companies went off and wrote the whole products on their own. And often, you know, one company had the same, if not, you know, had a similar, if not the same product to the other company. And he was, you know, will I buy the, you know, I don't know, will I buy the Samsung version or the Philips version? Do you know, that kind of way. But I suppose as things have become much bigger and also the rate of change has become so, so much faster, the ability now to build on top of stacks is the key. But what it has done is, and what I love is, it's, it, it's, it's broken down duplication. So we're now becoming a bit more sustainable in the sense that we're now you know, building our products um, on top of these, of, of these open source stacks. And what it means then is, you know, we've less and less people duplicating or doing, doing similar things. The other part which is fantastic is diversity. And to me, what diversity means is any person anywhere can contribute into an open source project as long as they have some device. And that is, you know, if you think about that for a second, that's mind blowing. Like, is there anyone here that comes from a very, very small village or town or area in the world? I do as well. I come from a, a very small area. Um, 
And this is fantastic. Like, it means it gives anybody opportunity to contribute, as I said, once you have a device. And I think that's, that's mind-blowing. Um, and the last thing I would say what open source provides is, is this idea we have shared environments. And that we'll say, you know, everyone doesn't need to have their own CICD. You know, we can build on, on the systems that are out there. A lot of the companies do feed back in and they provide environments, you know, like Google has done over the years with Kubernetes. Um, and in the other projects, other companies have done as well, where it allows us to, you know, if we're working away on something and we need a big environment and we just can't use our simple, small developing environment, we can go out there and use those environments in the communities. So that's fantastic as well. So it's, it's this idea of that, you know, we're sharing for, for the better rather than, you know, uh, duplicating for, for, for ourselves. The other aspect to that then is what open source projects give, we need, it needs to get, oh, oops, sorry, it needs to get something back. And uh, a colleague of mine now, who is now retired, um, Chris Ferris, he coined this phrase, you know, open source is not a free puppy. You know, it's, it's not just, you know what I mean, oh yeah, we, we are building our, we're building our products on top of this open source project, that open source project, oh isn't it great, we're getting it for free. Isn't it great that, you know, somebody's out there, you know, just doing it at their own time, you know what I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's not for free. And if we don't invest in it, it'd be like the project, like the picture here you see, one person in Nebraska thanklessly maintaining this since 2003. We all know what happens sometimes when one, one person maintains a key product that's used everywhere. I mean in, like, if you've got smart fridges at home, smart TVs, we all know a, a, a particular Java project that one poor person was maintaining and looking after, and then when something went wrong, some people wanted to point the finger at that person. Well, if you build your product on top of it, you need to point the finger inwards, not outwards, or put a mirror in front of yourself. The second part is around, and um, Michael Chin talked about this yesterday in a, in a really good um, uh, open panel talk with Amanda and with, uh, with Matt around, um, you know, creating your, um, your open source project, becoming an entrepreneur, etc. And one part of it was around, and he and Michael said it's a really difficult thing. What do you open source in your stack? And getting that right is really, really difficult. And sometimes companies have maybe put the stack out there and then realized, oh no, we've sold, we've sold the farm. Uh, we need to pull it back. Once it's gone out there, there's no pulling it back because what has happened is that stack's going to get forked and people are going to work away in parallel then. So, so that's another part of it is what do you put out there and then the licensing around that. I suppose most people, would you agree permissive licenses are the best? We have a few nods, yeah? You know, so those licenses are like Apache, MIT, BSD. Uh, and I suppose you want to kind of avoid the copylefts, uh, the GPLs, etc. So, you know, it's, it's how, what you put out there, and if you put it out there, uh, licenses so accordingly uh, as other, other open source projects are. Right. Let's tidy this up. So what have we talked about? One of the key parts is definitely be kind. Uh, hands up here who, if this might be the first uh, open source conference they've been at. We have a couple. Okay. No, that's, don't be shy to put your hand up. You have to start somewhere. Um, would you like someone like to say, what feeling have you got from, from the conference? You know, um, have you found people friendly? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, 
Have you found people to be more often than not uh, nice and decent people? Yeah. And I suppose that's a great thing about open source is it puts you out, in, <laughs> to not use the word, it puts you out in the open, so to speak, all right? So what it means is if you're going to be, as I say, that person, if you're going to act like a jerk, then like you're, <laughs> you're out in the open, so it's very easy to see, and uh, you'll basically, people will just move around you, you know, so. And, and that's a nice thing about it, like it's like, you know what I mean? It's, you know, you hear that phrase where, you know, be the person you are sitting on your own, you know, always, you know what I mean? Um, and, and it's kind people like that and people who are willing to contribute is what drives the communities on, and that's key. As I said, by the time you come into maintainer, you have ticked all the boxes, you've done all the work. So it's really a validation of where you are then. And then from then on, you're helping to steer that project forward. And you're more, more often than not, you're more involved in helping people than trying to push big features through, unless it's a key part of a release or something. And the last thing around the sustainability is communities need love. If you're going to use communities and you're going to build your products on communities, you need to give something back because it's not a free puppy, as I've said. And, oh yeah, one last thing I want to say, and it's on Tom as well. It was so interesting to hear Tom today because it was his first uh, uh, public talk. And um, what was really nice about it was that Open source gave him that opportunity to come up and speak today. And it will provide you with a lot of opportunities if you're starting out in this journey that you know, some of us wouldn't have got before. Like, you know, the idea to speak at conferences, to meet nice people, you know, to be able to, to, to drive forward. And for a lot of us, you know, we wouldn't be that visible. Like, it, like if I put a tweet out there, I'd get one or two likes maybe. Uh, you know, and I probably have to pay those two people as well. Uh, you know, Phil Easties maybe, if he's there on there, he, he would do it. But uh, obviously when Liz Rice does it, it'll be 100, 1,500 people or whatever. But just, do you know what I mean? That's because, uh, you know, she's just cool or whatever. So there's different levels to this, but what's nice about it is you can be at whatever level you want. You know, if you want to work away in the background, so be it. If you want to be a bit more involved, so be it. Like, if you want to be able to talk at conferences, you know, if you drive it along, you'll get the opportunities eventually. And don't worry because, you know, everyone gets their talks rejected, uh, you know, and it's just a part of life. But keep at it. And then by working on stuff, the opportunities will come up. And someone might say to you, we worked on that. Let's put in, let's put in a CFP for it. And, and, you know, if it's a key part of a community or a key part of, of the open source uh, ecosystem, there's a good chance you'll be, you'll be selected. So I suppose for my own, just... From my own feedback is I found it a really career changer over the last number of years. Um, I was 20 odd years working in enterprise and I've been through a lot of, you know, fads and changes, you know, from waterfall up to agile to et cetera. But the biggest change I've ever seen is coming out into open source. And, you know, sometimes you don't, you might think, oh, I don't have that safety net, but you do. It's kind of like, you know, the rock bands, they're, the lead singer will throw themselves out into the, out into the crowd. More often than not, you'll be get caught. You'll be, nearly you'll always get, get, get caught. There was someone that threw themselves out, all right, I can't remember who it was, but the crowd didn't catch him and they fell. So, yeah, but, yeah. So, thanks very much. Uh, questions, I suppose. Let's give Martin a round of applause first, and then hopefully we'll find some questions. I do get talks rejected as well sometimes. Sorry? I get talks rejected as well sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you get thumbs up on your, your, your tweets. <laughs> All right, who has a question for Martin? Great. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, First, I'm going to ask you a question before. Did you understand what I was saying? I did. I was told to speak slowly, my accent. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go on, mate. <laughs> uh, so my question is, um, around uh, open source projects where you might not have the technical skills, uh, particularly often they might be written in a different language. Um, what's the best way to sort of go about navigating that and steadily sort of learning it along the side of the project? A few things. 
Um, you can go out there and say, you know, look, I'm not sure of this. And as I said, one of the key things, first of all, is, you know, at least bringing down the project and trying to build it and see if you find issues in there. Helping out with the documentation and just saying, look, I'm new to this. I'm trying to build up my skill levels or whatever as I go along. And what's nice about it is if you do some of the things I was suggesting or your own ideas is you can do a lot of this quietly in the background for a while. So you can be trying stuff out and playing away with stuff until you get the courage. And one of those days you say, right, I'm there now. I'm getting going, you know, uh, especially if it's if you've done a language before, learning another language gets easier and easier because, you know, over the years, like the language I've done, the semantics are always the same, really. Concepts haven't changed since the 60s or 70s. The syntax just changes. Um, but give yourself a bit of time and build yourself in. But there's nothing wrong with coming out and saying, I want to help you in the community. I don't have uh, any experience in this. No, don't get put away because I've done it before. I've put it out into Slack saying, hi, I'm new or whatever, and nothing came back. <laughs> and then a week later, I did the same thing and nothing came back. And then I just started playing around with stuff and trying to find issues. So there's nothing wrong with that. And you can build it up bit by bit. And any, re anything, any PRs you push, the reviews always should be constructive, telling you, right, actually, it'd be better if you did it this way. You know, that kind of way. So yeah, don't be afraid of that. Yeah.